Okay, this is going to be the first video in a small series of GIMP tutorials about writing your own script foo scripts. So a while ago I made a tutorial about how to use a script that I wrote myself to create a color cycling animation effect in GIMP. And after that video I had many users express interest in a tutorial about how to write their own scripts in GIMP. So it's about time that I finally got around to doing that. And this will be a, this tutorial will have to be split up into several parts, I think, um, because it's going to cover a lot of material. Probably at least three videos, I would guess. And the end result, the end goal of this series is going to be to create a script which will allow us to generate random splatter brushes like this um, automatically. So I made a tutorial a long time ago about how to create a splatter brush like this yourself in GIMP. And the goal of this tutorial is to is for you to create your own script which will automatically make these splatter brushes for you. So for example, I already have the script made that I did. Here's just a couple other examples real quick of some that I just made with the script. And if I go to File, Create, I can create a new splatter brush and I choose some values that I want here and then click OK and will automatically make another splatter brush for me just like that. So basically the script just automates the process from that tutorial that I made a long time ago for creating your own splatter brushes. So if you think it would be cool to have a script that makes these splatter brushes for you randomly on the fly automatically I think you will hopefully enjoy this series of tutorials. It's going to take us a little while to build up to that point. I'm going to try to make these tutorials accessible to people who are brand new to this sort of thing. The, so the, the main goal of this very first video in the series is just going to be to introduce some of the basic features of, of how you would write a script in GIMP. Especially, we're just going to mostly focus on the actual programming language that ScriptFoo uses, which is the Scheme programming language, Scheme, S-C-H-E-M-E. -E. Okay, so to get started, what we're going to do is go to um, filters, script foo, console. Now if you have certain scripts installed on your computer um, in GIMP already, then you might have multiple um, script foo options in this menu. So just look for the one that has console inside of it, and that's what we're going to choose. Now after a couple seconds, this brings up this little window, which says, Welcome to Tiny Scheme. So this is the, the scheme interpreter that GIMP uses um, to translate the scheme code into stuff that GIMP can understand to uh, run your script. This gives us a window where we can test out different commands, see how things work, see some of the main features of Scheme before we actually get down to the nitty gritty of putting it all together in an executable script. So a function, a command you could do in Scheme is we could say, what is the sum of 2 and 3? So I could type plus 2, 3, all in close in parentheses, and it will execute that command and return the value of, as you would expect, 5. So this is a simple example of calling a function in Scheme. If you're used to something like C++ or Java, you're probably more used to type something like 2 plus 3, but this actually gives us an error in Scheme because every, even little simple mathematical operations in Scheme have to be um, formatted correctly as a function call. In other words, we have to call a function. A function is, is basically just a little a little procedure that you input values to and it outputs something to you. So this plus function, this addition function, this operator here, is a function called plus where we plug in you can plug in two or more numbers. In this case we plugged in the two numbers two and three and it outputted the value of five to us. Um, another example is we can multiply two numbers or maybe three numbers, two times three times two should be twelve. There we go. So the asterisk represents multiplication. We could also subtract um, what's five minus six, which would be negative one. We could also divide what's ten, sorry, put the operator first, ten divided by two is five. And we can nest those together. We could say what's the sum of the product of 5 and 2, which is 10, added to 3. So that result should be 13. 5 times 2 gives us 10. Then 10 plus 3 would give us 13. There we go. 
So th those are the operators that we have in Scheme. Those are essentially the most basic functions we have available to us. And we can define variables to use in these functions as well, rather than just using uh, simple numbers all the time. So we could define a variable, say x, and assign it the value of, say, 32. So a variable is just basically a little piece of data that we can store something in. So this x is a symbol, or it represents a number that we're going to store 32 in. So x is a variable holding the value 32, and we're def using this function define, right? This looks like a function, just like the addition, multiplication, subtraction, and, and division functions. We're defining a new variable to be the value of 32. We run that, and it just says, okay, we created this new variable x. And I can just type an x down here to see that x holds the value of 32 as we just defined it to. And now we can use that variable in the place, same places that we would use any regular old number. So, for example, I could say, what is the sum of 32, or let's say 30 and x. So 30 plus x, x is 32, so that sum should be 62. Now be careful, this didn't, we didn't actually change x, we didn't add, we didn't make x 30 bigger, we just added those two values together and got 62. The variable x still holds the value of just 32, not 62. If we wanted to change the value of x, we could do that by using this set function. So this is a name of a function again, so we started with the parentheses, put the name of the function right at the beginning. We could set the variable that we want to change the value of is going to be x, and the value that we want to give to it, let's say we want to give it that value that we just made up here, plus 30x. So first we're going to do x plus 30, which gives us 62, and then we're going to take that value and set x to be equal to that new value. Now x is actually equal to 62 because we added 30 to it and stored that new value back into the variable x. So we changed the value of x. So those are variables. Um, you can use any names you want for a variable. Like for example, I could say define my variable and store, I could, it doesn't have to be a number, it could be a word. I could just store the word hello here. Um, and now my variable contains that word, hello. There's other functions that we can use besides just the simple mathematical operators. We could also, for example, um, well, one example is we can test whether an object, whether a variable contains an integer or not. So, for example, we have this function called integer question mark, and it asks the question, is this thing that I type here an integer? So, is 5 an integer? Yes, it is. So, scheme returns this value t, which represents true. So that means that, yes, it's true that 5 is an integer. And so we can say, well, what about, um, is x an integer? Well, x currently holds the value of 62, so yes, it's true that x is an integer. But what about hello? Is that an integer? Well, that was my variable, and I called my variable. No, false, this is f stands for false. My variable is not an integer, so we got false. So that's another function we have. We also have a function in Scheme which allows us to generate random numbers. So for example, I could generate a random integer less than 100, and we get the value of 71. Or if I do the same thing again, I'll get another random number less than 100. Another random number less than 100. Um, so there we go. Okay, so those are some of the basic functions um, built into the programming language Scheme. But there are also some other functions that are especially built into just GIMP um, scripts that aren't available in general when using Scheme, but they're only available because we're using GIMP. We can see some of these functions that, that we are able to use through GIMP by going to this help menu up here and choosing the procedure browser. So this shows us a, li a list of a bunch of functions that that GIMP comes pre-built with um, that we can use to apply different effects. Basically, these are the functions that allow us to actually do things in GIMP. So, for example, we can run a function that changes the active paintbrush. So if I type right here, brush, let's see, we have a bunch of different things with brush in them, and we have this one, 
let's see. GIMP context set brush size. How about just set the brush? So this is a, a function which allows us to set the specified brush as the active brush. So all we do is call the function with this name, type in the name of the string um, corresponding to that brush, and the GIMP will change that to be the active brush. So I come back here to my script through console, and the, the function member was called GIMP context set brush. So GIMP context set brush, and we want to put a string containing the name of the brush that we want to change to the active brush. So for example, I could put quotation marks, capital S sparks. You have to type exactly the same name as it appears here. So even if my active brush was something else, after running this command, it would magically change to the sparks brush. We have other commands similarly. Um, there's one that says GIMP context set foreground. And this is a command that allows us to change the foreground color. So for example, if I type this, this is um, basically a list. This is the syntax and scheme for a list, which I'll discuss more in a second. Um, and it contains three numbers in this case, which represent the, R, the red, green, and blue components of a color in GIMP. So this is the RGB color system. So we have, this would be fully red, fully green, and no blue. And this corresponds to the color yellow. So if I run this command, then you can see over here, my GIMP foreground color automatically changes to yellow. So let me just discuss a little more br briefly uh, what a list is in the scheme. These are important concepts in the scheme. So a list is simply just a, a list. It's just a collection of data which is stored together um, all as one chunk, basically. So we can think of this as just like a list of numbers. So it doesn't have to be numbers, though. Here's an example. We can just type. You always need to, whenever you're creating a new list, you put a, this apostrophe or a single quotation mark at the beginning. And we can just put a list of some numbers or something here. They don't have to all be integers. They can be decimals. Some of them can be negative. And they don't even have to all be numbers. They could be words. And we close off the list with the end parentheses. And that's the end. And there we get a list which contains all of those items together. We could store these into a variable. For example, I could say define uh, my list. And I could put inside of it the word GIMP. Um, I could put in another list inside of this list, although if you put another list inside of a list, you don't include that single quotation mark anymore, so we just put parentheses, say one, two, three, and then we put some numbers here maybe, and we'll stop there, okay. So I just created my list, which contains this list, the first entry is a, this word GIMP, the second entry is another list, third entry is this number 45 and the fourth entry is this number 9. The kind of interesting thing about a list in, in Scheme is that we can't, in some sense, we can't directly access each entry of the list. We really can only access the first entry and then we can access the rest of the list all at once. So what does that mean? Or how would we show that? For example, I can type CAR and then my list and this will give me the first entry of that list. I'm not really sure where this notation comes from, but basically car represents give me the first item from this list. If I type CDR, which is sometimes pronounced as cutter, um, my list, then it will just give me the tail end of that whole list, or whatever was left over after we removed the first item. So it took that whole list and basically just chopped off the beginning and gave me a new list containing just those items. If I want to get the second item of my list, I could do, I want to get the head or the beginning of the list after I remove that first item. So first inside here, we take away the first item from the list and then we get the first item after that. So the first item after removing the original first item would in turn be the second item from our list, which was actually, in this case, a whole another list, one, two, three. Uh, but instead of writing this symbol, having to write these two functions 
twice like that, we can actually combine this all into one shortcut um, by just say, saying C A D R. So basically combine those, get rid of the extra C's and R's and just do C A D R my list and that will give us the same thing. So I guess the last thing that I'll cover for this video is just to explain um, the other way we can store data in a, in a list-like object would be an array, which we can make an array, for example, in Scheme, by typing, so I could say define my array, and I can use a special function called cons array to construct an array object, and I could say I want this array to contain four items, and I want them to all be numbers, so they're going to be type double. Oops, double. So this this function here, cons array, it's creating an array object with four spaces in it to contain numbers of type double. So these are these could be integers or decimals or anything that we want. They're basically, just any numbers. So let's go ahead and press enter. So I just created that array and stored it into the variable my array, and we can see if I type my array. Instead of a, a list which starts with an apostrophe or a single quote, an array starts with this pound symbol, and it has four items in that array, and they are all decimal numbers. And then I could change, for example, the first entry of that array by choosing a set, all one word, is the name of the function, so setting a value in an array, um, and I could change, for example, the thing you have to remember about an array is that the beginning entry really is the zero position, and this will be the first position, second position, third position. It's set the zero position to be the number 47. I um, have to tell, oops, have to tell what array to work with first. So set my array, set the zero position to be the number 47, and now my array looks like this, where that first entry of zero was changed to 47. I could set um, my array set the last entry which would be 3 to be the number negative 45 or something and there we go. And I can also access those each individual entry of the array by choosing a ref so get the reference of that array at the position so my array at the position 2 say which would actually be the third entry in a list so that would be 0. Um, if you don't really understand the difference between an array and a list for now, don't worry about it. It's not going to be terribly important for the purpose of this tutorial series. I'll discuss arrays more because we'll be using those in our script later on anyway. Um, but that's just an introduction to some of the things you can do. So, you know, I know this is a lot of material to cover in the first um, episode. If you've never done any of this before, it probably seems a little crazy and might not make any sense. If you're really having trouble with it, feel free to post a comment and ask questions. Uh, I can try to answer your questions there or in the future in the rest of this series. It would probably be a good idea to try to fiddle around with some of this stuff before my next video comes out to get a good handle on the material I covered in this video first before you try the later ones. Um, I'll also put a link in the description below where you can go to, there's a page on the official GIMP website. The documentation for GIMP there has a little tutorial on how to write scripts and it might be a good idea to start looking at some of that on your own and try to read that and see um, how these things work and uh, maybe you'll be a little more prepared to uh, follow along with my videos in the rest of the series. So I hope you did learn something today in this video. Uh, I hope you'll be stick around for the rest of the series and hopefully I will have the next part up fairly soon like in another week or so. So thanks for watching and I'll see you then.